Good day, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Donor Dad Shares His Daughter's AML Clinical Trial Story conference call. Today's conference is being recorded. At this time, I turn the conference over to Jennifer Gillette, social worker. Please go ahead. Thank you, Keith. Yes, my name is Jennifer Gillette, and I'm the staff social worker at the National Bone Marrow Transplant Link. I'd like to welcome you to our Lunch and Learn with the Link. This month's program will focus on the story of Donor Dad and his daughter's AML clinical trial experience. We will also have a discussion about clinical trials from the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. A special thank you to our sponsor for today's program, the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, Insight Corporation, Pharmacyclics and Janssen, and Omeris Corporation. We also thank our esteemed link partners. Just so everyone knows how our call is going to go today, we're going to have just a couple minutes at the beginning to share a little information about the National Bone Marrow Transplant Link, and then we'll hear from Dr. Omar Durrani, not only a physician, um, but donor to his precious daughter, Kenza, and then we'll hear from Leah Zumita from LLS, and then uh, we're going to open the floor for some questions. And then a couple minutes at the end, we'll also be just wrapping up and telling you about future programs. So for those of you who are not familiar with the link, our mission is dedicated to helping individuals and their families from diagnosis through survivorship. We provide resources, support, and education. Some of the resources we provide to help families navigate their transplant journey are our webinars, podcasts, blogs, lunch and learn calls like the one you're on today with a variety of topics such as chronic graft versus host disease, disease specific information, caregiving, coping, treatment options, and survivorship after a transplant. We have an active Facebook page with daily inspiration and relevant tips for survivorship. We have our peer support mentor program for patients with caregivers, donors as well. And we have our second birthdays recognition program. We also have books, referrals, and emotional support from a licensed social worker. So if you need any extra support, please feel free to reach out to us. Uh, before we begin today's program, just a couple reminders. First of all, let's be mindful in trying to be concise with our questions so that we may answer as many as possible. Also, please know that the information provided in this program is meant to stimulate conversation with your own healthcare provider and is not meant to replace your individualized medical plan. So now on to the educational part of our program. We are so thankful to have our first speaker here with us, Dr. Omar Durrani. He received his postgraduate education at St. George's University and he did his residency at the University of Texas Southwestern Parkland Memorial Hospital, where he was chief resident from 2014 to 2015. He has a passion for preventative care and works with his patients to develop personalized health care plans. However, no amount of medical training could adequately prepare him for the news that his nine-month-old daughter had a rare form of leukemia, AML. But that's the position Dr. Omar Durrani found himself in when Kenza was diagnosed in 2016. After failing to find an exact match when his daughter required a transplant, Dr. Durrani became his daughter's donor for a haplotransplant. He has learned so much on this journey, including the need to register more bone marrow donor, donors in minority communities, the importance of being a strong patient advocate for your child, and how to persevere during the most challenging of circumstances. He is here today to share his story, to spread the word on the importance of increasing the registry and the importance of clinical trials, and also to provide hope to those on the journey. Thank you so much, Dr. Durrani, for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, I'm very happy to be here, and it's an it's absolute pleasure. Well, can you tell us about your story, Dr. Durrani? Sure. So in, in 2016, around uh, March, uh, I was I had just completed residency, uh, and I was a, a brand-new graduate practicing family medicine. Um, and we had uh, our, our firstborn, Kenza, uh, who was at that time around nine months old, uh, started getting a a swollen gland on the right side of her neck and at first didn't think too much of it uh and it's one of those dichotomies of 
being a family doctor or also being a dad, you really try to figure out what hat to wear here. And and really, it's very common to have maybe a swollen gland, some runny nose as, as, as kids grow up and get exposed to different bugs. Didn't think too much of it, but after a couple of weeks, the, the gland on the right side really started to grow and harden. And it's at that point that we had her uh, taken to her pediatrician and, and, and really were provided reassurances and, and, and were told to probably start some antibiotics. Maybe there's an infection in the lymph node. And, and again, here, it, you just go through the motions and think, okay, that's fine. And unfortunately, the antibiotics were not working, and this this gland or this swollen uh, uh, area on Kenza's uh, neck uh, really grew so much so that uh, we were sent off to go see an ENT surgeon who is a specialist in ear, nose, and throat, a pediatric uh, surgeon, uh, where an ultrasound was done, and really, uh, this is where sometimes in medicine that. Things aren't as clear cut. There's always going to be some gray areas. And, and so here the, the pediatric specialists were telling us that she needs to get admitted to the hospital and get some IV antibiotics. And really at that point, maybe, uh, they can, uh, drain the lymph node because the imaging and the testing, uh, really didn't show anything else. So we were actually in the hospital for three or four days, finished the antibiotics, were sent home to schedule later on a, a procedure potentially to get this lymph node drained. But this is really where we started getting concerned because no one really knew exactly what was going on. And uh, despite sometimes being a younger physician, sometimes you uh, ask some questions, but there's really no answers and you have some thoughts in your head of what this could be. Uh, but it really starts becoming more and more uh, of a concern. And in the back of your mind, you start thinking of more ominous things, but you don't really want to bring that into your forefront of your mind and thinking you kind of suppress that somewhere and you kind of go through the motions. And as we were waiting actually post hospitalization to get the appointment to maybe schedule a procedure for this uh, swollen gland um, uh, in a serendipitous way, uh, I was changing her uh, diaper on a changing table. And as I had turned around for a split second just to grab a diaper, um, she had actually turned over and fell off the changing table to the ground and hit her head on the carpet. But at that age and whatnot, I was really concerned and, and worried. Um, this is the first time where my wife was calming me down as I was internally freaking out, thinking, you know, she fell off a changing table. We rushed her to the ER, even though she was acting okay, just to be safe. We went ahead and, and went there. And in the ER visit there, I actually knew the physician as I did my training here in Dallas at Children's Medical. And they examined Kenza and said everything is fine from the standpoint of the fall. And it was at that point where I had, you know, had enough in regards to my concerns. Uh, and I really asked the ER doctor to do uh, a, a, a simple blood test that actually had not been done until that point and, and a particular type of, of CBC. And I got the same resistance at first, but then, you know, we were in the ER. We've been through all this. They went ahead and then ran the test. And, um, it was at really at that point that our life changed and it was a complete paradigm shift and everything moving forward. Um, I still remember the look of the ER doctor, uh, calling me to come out of the room and, and just really handing me the paper that had the lab results. Um, since we knew each other and were physicians, he didn't really need to say anything. He just handed me the paper and just said to me, you know, I'm very sorry. And I looked at the paper and what I saw there was uh, something which immediately I knew what was going on. It was a, it's a test called the CBC, which is a complete blood count. And the white blood cells, which is a major portion of this test called CBC, the normal range for an individual or a child even can be anywhere between something called 3 to 10 or 3 to 11, which is 3,000 to 11,000 white blood cells in that sample of blood. And Kenza's uh, white blood cell count was not 3 to 11, it was 455. 
and that's 455,000 white blood cells in, in that sample of the blood. And that is an incredibly high number, and there's only one reason that can be um, a cause, and that is a blood cancer or a leukemia. When it's that high, it's an emergency um, because the blood, even at a nine-month-old baby, the blood is so thick uh, because of all the cancer cells, there is a absolute risk of having a heart attack or a stroke or an ischemic event. And so she was immediately transferred via ambulance to the main medical center here in Dallas called Children's Medical Center Dallas, straight to the ICU and had to undergo a, a procedure called the leukophoresis, which is a very dangerous procedure, but in essence, it's taking uh, out the blood, filtering out all the thick uh, excess white blood cells and putting back in the blood to ensure there's no stroke or event. And this all happened within 90 minutes, maybe two hours from the standpoint of getting that result and getting transferred via ambulance to an ICU. And it, it's just shock and awe. And, and you kind of still, sometimes my wife and I, I you know, for sure we kind of have flashbacks and think about, you know, those moments, uh, certain things kind of trigger it. But it really, at that moment, you're just really trying to process everything. Everything's going 200 miles an hour. So Kinza, uh, uh, in short, she went to the ICU, underwent this dangerous leukophoresis procedure, and uh, she was actually intubated, uh, which is something they have to do to make sure um, they can tolerate this this procedure. Uh, and so, you know, it went from a fall from a changing table to within three to four hours being intubated in an ICU. And that kind of shift is sometimes difficult to process. Thankfully, it went well, um, and she was transferred to an oncology floor, and we met with multiple doctors, uh, hematologists, oncologists on, on staff, and, and were told to that she had this rare form or more aggressive form of AML, acute myeloid leukemia. And uh, that obviously uh, chemotherapy will be started and that we will see how this progresses or how this uh, treatment occurs. So she underwent the first round of chemotherapy and obviously as we process everything uh, at her age, she, she was uh, tolerating it uh, quite well the first round. Um, and uh, at the end of the, the course of the first round, uh, testing has to be done to see if there's any remaining cancer cells. And unfortunately, after the first round, we uh, found out that the chemo did not work and there's still cancer cells remaining in her blood. And so a second round was started, which is a much more higher dose and more aggressive type of chemotherapy regimen. And this is where we really started talking to um, our oncologist and, and, and figuring out, well, what happens after this and, and what are our options? Um, and we were informed that after this round, there would be another round of chemo. And if that uh, is something that does not uh, work, um, then we have to really look for a, a match or a, a blood donor to see if there's a match for a, a stem cell transplant. Um, and, and unfortunately, if that doesn't work, then it is really looking at palliative care. And so it, processing all this all within a few weeks really becomes a struggle. But in AML, you have to get admitted to the hospital and you stay in the hospital. So uh, March uh, and pretty much all of 2016, we were at uh, the hospital. She underwent the second round of chemotherapy, a more aggressive round, um, and it, you started to see some of the signs of the effects of it, even at that age, although children have... Uh, healthy organs are very resilient resilient um, this higher doses um, can really start taking effect. She tolerated it fairly well, um, but unfortunately, uh, at the end, when we were doing the testing, another gut punch uh, hearing that this round did not do the job as well, and there's still um, remaining cancer cells and so we put all our hopes in this third round of chemotherapy to see if this could potentially be it so we could avoid the the concept of a bone marrow transplant, which really seems so foreign and, and even more intimidating. Um, at this point, we actually started working with uh, DKMS and our local community, friends, family, um, my, my colleagues, my physician colleagues, about 
starting drives and really starting to see if there is a match uh, for Kenza for a, a, a stem cell uh, uh, donor. Um, the third round of chemo went by and then in higher dosing and and this round was a little bit more difficult to tolerate, but she she did she did fine. Um, and as we anxiously wait for the test results after finishing the course, um, unfortunately, uh, the, our fears arose when every time we find out that again this third round did not uh, do the trick, and she still has cancer there. And, and really, uh, by that time, um, the, the community, DKMS, and, and everyone around us uh, did as much as they can, and, and really, uh, we, we we had drives almost, I think, a total of 82 drives in over 40 cities throughout the U.S., and uh, we signed up close to 3,000 people, but uh, the the aspect here of the match was very difficult. Her genetics and, and maybe the, the, the findings for her were, were very unique, and there was no obvious match uh, despite the amazing turnout and, and all, all the drives and all the people that signed up. And around this time, we had about three to four weeks to figure out what we wanted to do. And um, I had reached out to a lot of my colleagues and, and, and networks to figure out what options we have if we cannot find a match and then and, and really look at uh, if there's any studies available or if there's any uh, uh, forefront uh, uh, avant-garde type of uh, research uh, that can throughout the country, wherever there may be, if there's any possibility of something that Kenza would qualify for, for us to do because we had no other choice. If we do not find a match, there is no other option. And and, and so calling around, um, I was connected with Julie Gallo, who's with uh, Target uh, AML or Pediatric um, AML um, Initiative, uh, and now she's with LLS. I had reached out to Fred Hutch uh, through a connect of mine and a, a professor of mine at UT Southwestern and also uh, spoke with uh, St. Jude's and, and really uh, sent over uh, medical records and sent over her um, particular type of uh, genetics and the type of AML she had to see if there's any qualifications for some of the research that may be there of newer therapies or maybe um, if there's uh, some medications that could be approved by insurance as a one-time trial. Um, and through that, uh, our main oncologist uh, at, at Children's Dallas also uh, was researching, obviously, on our behalf, and, and, and we found a study. It was a Bellicum study for CAR-T therapy um, for a T-cell modified uh, therapy that was actually made, the, the, the research and then and the study is made and eventually got approved for ALL. Uh, acute lymphocytic leukemia, but they they were able to get approved um, per our request uh, for, from the pharmaceutical company to get approved for AML. And it, for us, uh, since there really wasn't anything that she was qualified for anywhere else, it was uh, fate and luck and uh, the opportunity was there here in Dallas, you know, although we were willing to go anywhere in the country to get this done, it was right here in our backyard, and we were able to enroll her in this um, uh, study or trial of uh, the medication, which was the CAR-T therapy, where they actually uh, would take one of our, uh, my wife or I, we were trying to figure out who's the best match, and, and, and take our T cells, modify them using a viral vector gene, and, and are able to control the um, graft versus host effect after a stem cell transplant, which can be um, very, very severe. So we did the testing to figure out who's a slightly better match. There was no ideal match, obviously, between my wife and I. And my wife ended up becoming a slightly better match for the haploid transplant in the study. Um, and when we were doing her testing, we actually found out that she was pregnant. <laughs> A complete, you know, uh, blindsided by this, but a, a blessing nonetheless. And 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 when my wife, we found out about um, her pregnancy with now our four-year-old daughter Nora, um, 
it was my turn. I was up to bat um, because obviously my wife could not do the, the the study and the treatment to be the donor. And although I wasn't the ideal match, obviously things happen for a reason, uh, my, my strong belief. And, and I was given a, a medication called Filgastrin, which builds up my um, stem cells. Uh, and I was a donor uh, just a, a week later where through a plasmapheresis, they would take my uh, T cells and it was sent off to this pharmaceutical lab in the study to modify it, use the CAR T therapy and get the process ready for Kenza's uh, infusion of the stem cell transplant, which was on August 2nd um, of 2016. And, and the rest is history. She's She did terrific. Um, the transplant went uh, uh, perfectly. Uh, there was some scary moments uh, after the transplant. The, the, the chemotherapy regimen done during stem cell transplant is very intense. And uh, afterwards, the graft versus host effects uh, is something that can happen at any point. And there's this one very dangerous version called veno-occlusive disease or VOD that can occur. And it's a very high mortality rate. And, you know, this sometimes maybe being a physician, this is something that uh, I think about maybe some families not having that access or not having that thought process, you know, I don't know. I was just so paranoid about this whole VOD. It was just in my head constantly that I had just really asked the oncologist on pretty much daily to do an ultrasound of her liver. Although they said it wasn't needed, we ended up doing it and we caught the VOD extremely early and then were given a medicine that really reversed it and stopped it. And that really moved things forward to pass through the biggest um you know, speed bump, which is that VOD aspect. Once we went past this, Kenza really did well um, and tolerated well. And and, and now she is uh, five years post uh, transplant um, and, and is doing terrific. Thankfully, um, she still will have um, uh, yearly checkups. We do an ultrasound of her heart uh, every year to make sure because of the history of chemo to make sure the heart's working strong. And, and she's doing terrific. She's a spunky, uh, rambunctious little five-year-old and now six-year-old and, and then in the light of our life. And, and really, she doesn't know just yet. We're trying to figure out and articulate to her uh, what she's been through and then and, and, and really the, the cause that she really has helped driven in regards to getting um, folks signed up for the bone marrow registry, especially the minority community and, and raising awareness um, through Kenza's drives. Although we didn't find a match for her, we found matches for two people and hopefully much more as we move forward. But yeah, um, it, it's quite a journey uh, emotionally, physically, er every aspect. And um, but thankfully, uh, Kenzo today is, is doing great. Thank you so much, Dr. Durrani, for sharing your story. I, I think anyone who hears it is just truly moved. Um, our hearts are with you, family, and so thankful that you were able to advocate and do what you did to help your daughter today. Um, I'm sure we're, people are going to have questions for you, but before we do, get to questions. I also want to make sure that we hear from Leah Zumita from the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. She's the Director of Nursing Clinical Trial Support Center at L. In her role as Director of Nursing, uh, she is, uh, forgive me, uh, they make efforts and support patients and caregivers affected by blood cancers. Through education, advocacy, coaching, and decision support services, Leah and the team of nurses, patients, and their caregivers navigate the process of identifying and participating in clinical trials and providing support through the continuum of their treatment and care. LLS is the world's largest voluntary health agency dedicated to blood cancer. Its mission is to cure leukemia, lymphoma, and myeloma, improve the quality of life for patients and their families. Prior to LLS, Leah was a clinical nurse specialist and clinical nurse educator at Brigham Women's Hospital in Boston, Massachusetts. She is certified as an adult health critical care clinical nurse specialist and critical care RN. Leah graduated from St. Anselm College with a bachelor's
Bachelor of Sciencing and obtained her Master of Science in Nursing at the University of Massachusetts, Boston. She currently resides in Foxborough, Massachusetts with her husband and three children. Thank you for joining us today, Leah. Thank you, Jennifer, for that kind introduction. I'm so happy to be here. Dr. Durrani, I can't thank you enough for sharing your family's journey. It's just a remarkable remarkable testament of strength and hope. Um, I'm very humbled and grateful to be able to join you on this call today. So I'm here today to talk more about the challenges of clinical trial enrollment and what the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society has done to help support patients and families such as the Durrani through this process. Um, So for those of you that don't know, the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society is a global leader in the fight against cancer, and our mission is to cure leukemia, lymphoma, Hodgkin's disease, and myeloma, and improve the quality of life of patients and their families. LLS funds life-saving blood cancer research around the world. We provide free information and support services, and we are the voice for all blood cancer patients in seeking access to quality, affordable, and coordinated care. So Dr. Durrani shared a powerful story about the journey to um, the clinical trial and the transplant for Kenza. And so I'll start a little bit. I'll go back to the basics. You know, what is a clinical trial? Well, a clinical trial is a carefully controlled research study that's conducted by doctors to improve the care and treatment of people with cancer or other illnesses. Anything that is currently FDA approved, whether it's prescribed by a physician or even available over the counter at your local pharmacy, was at one time in a clinical trial. And as you know, this story shows, clinical trials really are a key step in advancing cancer treatment. One thing I really want to emphasize today is that there are clinical trials for every stage of disease for blood cancer patients. Um, whether you're newly diagnosed and haven't yet started treatment, or on watch and wait therapy um, for disease that relapsed or um, came back after treatment or maybe never responded to treatment, even clinical trials for people on maintenance therapy and remission and into survivorship. Uh, The challenge is that in the United States, only about 5 to 8% of adults with cancer are participating in clinical trials. That number is slightly higher for children. It's somewhere around 20%, but you know, you might be thinking, well, what's the consequence of such low enrollment rates? And the problem is is that just about 20% of cancer clinical trials in the U.S. close, not because their treatment is unsafe or ineffective, but because the trial is never able to enroll enough patients. And so what we really need to do is help increase the awareness of clinical trials as a potential treatment option early at diagnosis and at every change in treatment plan. And we really need to increase the diversity of our clinical trial participants so that the patient population in these studies is representative of our diverse society. So Dr. Durrani shared some barriers to clinical trial enrollment. He did a tremendous job of advocating on Kenza's behalf, but it can be really overwhelming to try to figure out what clinical trial someone may be eligible for. And I always like to tell people that wanting to enroll in a clinical trial and actually enrolling is not a straight path. There are many, many barriers or bumps in the road. And, you know, trying to find out information and understand information about clinical trials is really challenging. Then trying to figure out if you're eligible based on your own past medical history, your treatment history, the specific details about your diagnosis, like genetic markers and mutations, is even harder. And so, you take all that complex, all those complex issues, and then you add other barriers like finances, um, health insurance, whether or not that clinical trial might be in your network, or if you don't have health insurance, or if you need to travel away from home to be able to be in that trial, there's other expenses for food, lodging, travel, et cetera. So there are just so many barriers. And what we've seen in the setting of the COVID-19 pandemic is that all of the same barriers to clinical trial enrollment exist, but now they're even worse, and the process is even more daunting. So the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society developed what is called the Clinical Trial Support Center as a way to help patients and their family members through this process. So the Clinical Trial Support Center, or the CTSC, is a free service. And we're a group of nurse navigators with expertise in blood cancer. And as I mentioned, we help patients or their family members identify potential clinical trials and overcome all of those barriers to enrollment. 
our nurses work to really understand who the person is they're working with. Um, we get to know everything from their past medical history to their diagnosis and treatment history to their psychosocial support system. We really want to understand who it is we're working with. We want to understand their goals of treatment as well. And so we take that information, we do the deep dive into the clinical trials, and we really provide a very individualized list of clinical trials that someone may be potentially eligible for. Um, we emphasize the importance of shared decision-making with your healthcare team. So we tell everyone, take the list that we provide you and bring it back to either your healthcare team or take it to your second opinion for their expertise. And then we can work directly with you and your healthcare team to overcome any barriers to accessing the treatment that's best for you. And the, the nurse navigator team is comprised of pediatric nurse practitioners, adult nurse practitioners, clinical trial research nurses, BMT and cellular therapy nurses, and other advanced practice nurses. So we really have a great team to help meet you um, on your journey. So the philosophy of our group is to work one-on-one -on -one with a patient or caregiver throughout the entire journey. Now, that may not be enrolling in a clinical trial. It might be going ahead with standard of care therapy or going forward with transplant. It might be helping someone get something through off-label use. It may also be transitioning to palliative care. Um, but what is important is that you will have a nurse that is with you every step of the way to help overcome any barriers that happen. So we also have, you know, the wonderful privilege of working closely with our information specialists at LLS who are master's prepared social workers and nurses to help loop in other resources as well. Because as I mentioned, some of those barriers include financial resources, it may include um, educational needs, there's a multitude of different barriers, and so we pull in any resources possible to help you. So if you're interested in learning more about clinical trials um, and whether it may be an option for you, please call our Information Resource Center at LOS. Uh, the number is 1-800-955-4572. And you can also go to our webpage and complete a referral form. The web address is www.lls.org forward slash CTFC. And once we receive your referral form, a nurse navigator will reach out to you right away. So, um, in, you know, in closing with my part, I just want to say, um, you know, after we've all had the amazing opportunity to hear about the Durrani family and their remarkable journey, it's because of patients like Kenza that LLS really wants to fundamentally change how children with pediatric acute leukemia, including AML, such as Kenza's diagnosis, um, are treated through something called the um, Pedal Pediatric Master Trial. And so um, just to give you a little information about that, the Pedal Trial is going to be a global precision medicine master trial that's going to test multiple targeted therapies simultaneously at up to 200 clinical sites worldwide. So this is not just in the United States. Um, what we know is that children, um, you know, are not just little adults and the way that the way that cancer behaves in children and how children respond to treatment is very different than adults. And so, you know, we've seen this dramatic revolution in cancer treatment thanks to pre precision medicine, and now we need to try to focus those efforts with children. Um, so this is a really exciting opportunity. Um, the pedal trial will be opening soon, and it is just one part of the children's initiative within LLS, which is really looking to help patients and their family members and support them along their journey. So if you're interested in learning more about the Children's Initiative at LLS or the Pediatric Master Trial, um, please call our Information Resource Center at 1-800-955-4572. Thank you Jennifer, so much, back. Leah. <laughs> sure. Yes, yes. Thank you so much. We we really appreciate you being here today and that, and it's, it's so um, promising to hear about the research you're doing. Um, at this time, Keith, can you please tell our callers how they can ask questions? Absolutely. Ladies and gentlemen, if you'd like to ask a question, you may do so by pressing star 1 on your telephone keypad. Please, If you're on a speakerphone, please make sure your mute function is turned off to allow your signal to reach our equipment. A voice prompt on your phone line will indicate when your line is open. Please state your name before posing your question. 
star 1 for questions. We'll pause a moment to assemble the phone queue. And while we're pausing, waiting for people to dial in, I'm just going to start with a couple questions here. Uh, Dr. Durrani, we always like to ask people how they got through some tough moments. For any of the other parents that might be on this phone call experiencing what you and your poor to go through, what were things that got you guys through and coped during those most challenging times? Sure. Um, that's a wonderful question and something, you know, it, it, during that time and in, in, in those moments, it, it, it really is almost like just trying to make it through uh, the day. Um, and, and what really starts helping in regards to getting through such a difficult period of time is um, trying to attain small goals. I mean, obviously, there's a big mountain uh, ahead of you in regards to uh, mentally attempting to climb that to get over. Uh, here, really making small goals of just getting over, you know, maybe this round of chemo or um, you know, finishing uh, this antibiotic and then making sure, you know, there's no complications. Just smaller, more palatable little goals, uh, focusing on those and checking those off mentally it really starts adding up, um, of course, just like anything else in life. And looking back, um, you can really see how far um, one has come. And then, um, obviously, faith, uh, spirituality uh, is a big component for many. Uh, another very um, important aspect is tapping into your uh, intimate, trusted circle, um, whether it is a f a direct family or close friends, relatives, um, or a, a trusted circle, and really delegating um, maybe uh, aspects of, of things that you may be concerned or worried about, but, but sharing those with people you trust make a, makes a huge impact on and, and helping you feel maybe a little bit more uh, light and ha having the energy to kind of mentally go through um, the rigors of what you need and you don't feel like you have to do it alone. Um, and, and I think that really for us, uh, we, we really uh, leaned on our, our, our close friends and our, our family that we were blessed to have around us um, that really kind of helped us uh, taking off some of the weight that's there. But my biggest thing is really looking at smaller, tiny goals and then really focusing on maybe per day or per week. And then as things move on, um, you really can see the, the trajectory and then makes things a lot more palatable. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Uh, is there any questions in the queue yet, Keith? We have no questions at this time. Okay, well, I'm going to give everybody a little more time to think of questions they might have, and I will uh, direct w one question towards Leah. Um, one second here. Uh, Leah, if a doctor suggests a clinical trial to a patient, does that mean that there's no other treatment options left for them? That's a great question, Jennifer. No, it, it, it doesn't always mean that. And, you know, there are clinical trials for every stage of disease. And what, as I mentioned, you know, there's for clinical trials for people who have not yet started treatment, for people whose disease came back or didn't respond, et cetera. But um, what we want is the topic of clinical trials to be talked about early on because we do need to, to eliminate that stigma that clinical trials must mean there is no more hope. Um, Clinical trials offer some really fantastic care and some, some of the best treatment options available. And so the more that they are offered to patients, the more we can increase the opportunities for enrollment and we can advance the treatments. And I think that the, um, the story of Kenza is such a great example of, of why we need to continue to do that. Thank you. Thank you. And real quick, too, I know sometimes people are concerned about clinical trials thinking that they might get a placebo instead of an actual treatment. Is there any truth to that statement? It is a very common uh, misconception or myth about clinical trials. What I can tell you is that in a cancer clinical trial, 
no one will only receive a placebo. That would be completely unethical. Um, in a clinical trial for cancer patients, you are at a minimum going to receive what is the best approved therapy for your disease. Um, sometimes in the later phase uh, trials, excuse me, phase three, where you have two groups of patients, one who gets the treatment being studied and a group of patients who get the best available try, uh, best approved therapy, there may be a placebo in there, but again, you would never only receive a placebo in a cancer clinical trial. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. And, and Dr. Durrani, I have one for you. I know I've heard from some parents that they're concerned about getting different opinions. They don't want to offend their health care team. What are your thoughts about second opinions, uh, especially when it comes to your child? Yeah, absolutely. A very important uh, question. You know, when it comes to uh, your your child, uh, you have to be their biggest advocate, of course, because they may not be able to articulate or, or provide that uh, uh, for them. And it's your duty to be their biggest advocate. And I think one of the most important avenues to that is to make sure um, the treatment or the decision on therapy uh, is the most appropriate or um, the, the the best option for them. And that that may not be as clear cut. And so in the setting of uh, deciding uh, for something as important as uh, a treatment regimen to tr- for a cancer, um, much less, you know, a, a surgical uh, consult, it's always important to get a second opinion and sometimes even a third opinion. Now, we don't want too many cooks in the kitchen, but in, in something as nuanced as uh treatment uh, for uh, cancer, especially for a child, uh, getting multiple opinions is going to be crucial. If there's one uh, physician who is saying one thing and another physician who backs that up or really says the the same treatment option, that provides a huge reassurance and, and reaffirmation into the plan. If the second opinion says the opposite or something completely different, you know, that really uh, provides an avenue to talk to both uh, 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 doctors and, and, and see what are the differences and, and why one feels one way versus the other feels the other way. Because in medicine, uh, yes, there are regimens, there's protocols, but um, there are some nuances. There is an art in medicine, and there may be some aspects of, of care that um, another physician may feel very strongly about that actually pulls uh, the decision uh, uh, for for a better approach, possibly. Um, and and whether it's not as simple as you know a a strep test for strep throat. This is a much more complex uh, situation, and I, I tell my own patients uh, to get a second opinion when it comes to something that is more uh, pronounced as obviously as as cancer treatment, or even when it comes to uh, we're talking about knee or hip replacements. If there's different versions of doing a procedure, it's it's very important. Uh, and, and, and as physicians, we know this. And it, this is not something that hurts our feelings or becomes a, a, a vendetta or an issue. This is known. It's in the field. And especially in something like cancer treatment, getting a second, third opinion is very common. And, and in fact, um, it, it's something that some doctors will actually even bring up and, 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 and tell their patients about getting a, a second opinion and proactively. And so don't ever hesitate to ask your doctor about coordinating for a second opinion, um, and by no means uh, do do physicians really take that personally. And if they should, if they do, that's really uh, not appropriate or the right thing because in, in this setting, it's not about ego. It's not about uh, saying that I'm right. It, it really is about providing the best care for the patient or the family, and and that entails getting the multiple opinions and and really discussing it in detail. Thank you so much. Keith, do we have any questions at this time? We do have questions in the queue. We'll take our first question from. Hi, Jennifer. It's Lou Christie. How are you? Lou, how are you? I'm good. I have a question for Dr. Durrani. I I am a HAPLA recipient. 
I'm just wondering if his daughter has any GVHD symptoms. Hi, Lou. Uh, pleasure speaking with you. Uh, so in regards to Kenza, uh, thankfully, uh, we're blessed she does not have any um, chronic graft-versus-host or uh, uh, recurrent sequelae of, of graft-versus-host for her at this point. Now being the fifth year, we still will uh, perform a um, cardiac ultrasound for doxorubicin and some of the chemotherapy regimens that can affect the heart structure uh, at her age uh, with the healing ability at this age and one of the silver linings uh, it tends to be not as much a, of an issue but just for due diligence but thankfully um, she is doing great and there are no um, GVD uh, situations for her, for her particular case. Oh, that's good news. Absolutely. Yes, thank you so much. Star one for questions. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, my apologies. I was just going to say we'll take our next question from. And caller, your line is open. Hi, this is Amy from DKMS. Thank you so much for um, sharing this incredible story that inspired thousands to sign up as potential donors. And um, my question, Dr. Durrani, is can you tell us a little bit about the donor search and how Ancestry plays a role and why it's y'all's mission to sign up as many people who share your same um, Ancestry diversity as possible? Hey, Amy. Very, very good question. Very important question. Um, for us, when we were in that phase of trying to figure out uh, what to do next and, and, and try to attempt to get a, a match for Kenza, uh, it's not as simple as just submission, submitting a request. We really needed uh, somebody to uh, work as a proxy for us and, and try to find a, a match for her. And um, thankfully, there are great organizations um, uh, like DKMS and Be The Match. And we actually connected with uh, DKMS uh, uh, through a, a, the, the Hospital Connect. And, and DKMS really was our army outside of the hospital room, helping the, the drives uh, by uh, coordinating drives throughout the DFW uh, Metroplex and also the country. And, and, and organizing uh, almost 80 drives, uh, really, while we were just focusing on, on Kenza and the background, this was occurring day in, day out for weeks um, and signing up so many people. And we really, the, the, the focus here was to find a, a match for Kenza, and, and that really will come down to mainly uh, from, a, from a genetic standpoint, uh, and then an appropriate match will come down to um, HLA, and that it can focus on folks in the same uh, ethnicity or uh, background. So individuals who are maybe of um, East Asian descent versus individuals uh, who are of African descent, the matches are likely going to be within the same ethnicity or background. And as of right now, typically, if a patient is needing a, a bone marrow a match reg from, a, from the registry, uh, the majority of registrants are of Caucasian descent, and there's maybe between a 60 to 70 percent chance of finding a match versus significantly lower match numbers for more minority um, uh, patients, uh, African, Middle East, Asian, uh, South Asian uh, descent. And, and then creating awareness in these communities is crucial, and that's really what our focus was for not only Kenza and our, our vouch to find a match for her, but moving forward, really raising awareness, removing the stigma that may be there in the minority communities, increasing awareness through grassroots efforts, because the more people that register, the more matches that will be found, especially in, in these communities, and the match rate may go up significantly higher than what it is currently. So it, it's really important to... Um, not only create awareness, uh, but make sure you are registered and, and, and there's ways to do this. And there is no cost uh, for the actual uh, registry uh, just requesting the kit or, or going to a drive to get it done. And 
It, it really is just a 60 second mouth swab um, that can potentially save a life. Uh, so DKMS was wonderful for us and, and really uh, was a huge advocate for us to help potentially find a match for Kenza, but now there are matches for others through this. Thank you. Hey, Amy, can you tell our callers if anyone wants to sign up to get a kit, how they would do that with DKMS? Sure. Thank you so much. So um, anyone who is interested in being a potential donor for a patient like Kenza um, or other blood cancer, blood disorder patients can sign up. It's really easy. It's a cheek swab. Um, anyone between the ages of 18 and 55 years old can sign up. You order a kit online and it's sent to your home and then you go on ahead and send it back. And there actually is an NBMT link um, virtual drive that is set up. So I am going to go on ahead and give you that link. Um, it is at dkms.org. Um, that's D like Dallas, dkms.org. And if you go to our virtual drive section and you put in NBMT link, you will find um, – the NBMT link virtual drive. So dkms.org, anyone between 18 and 55 who's in good health can sign up. And um, hopefully together we will find more matching donors. Thank you so much. I, I really appreciate you calling in and sharing that information with everyone today. Thank you. Okay. Is there any more questions, Keith? We have no further questions in the queue. Okay. Well, uh, it sounds like everyone has gotten their questions answered. And so today we might just end a couple minutes early, but I just really want to thank both Dr. Durrani and Leah for joining us. I, I feel like this was a very moving um, presentation, and I hope that those of you listening uh, got – something extra today to help you through your own journey. And I also want to thank everyone for calling in. Uh, just so you all know, we have a multitude of programs happening this fall to support you. Next week, we have our webinar on chronic graft versus host disease. So keep an eye out for emails, Facebook. You can also go on to our website at mbmtlink.org and sign up for that. And if you'd like any other information about survivorship issues or support, feel free to reach out to us at 1-800-LINK-BMT, which is L-I-N-K-B-M-T. And if anyone wants to join our peer mentor program uh, for helping others get through this journey, we are always looking for good peers. So we encourage you to reach out as well. But again, thank you to our speakers, our sponsors, our link partners, and everyone for joining us. I hope you have a great day.